Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we are continuing with our lesson series, Prototopus Mystery. This will be part 370. And our lesson for today is the falling away. Mm. The falling away. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches, after a time of teaching foundational truths, fundamental truths, organized religion would be infiltrated by false teachers, bringing in false doctrines, and also some who would become corrupted because of their leadership and their authority in the church. Mm -hmm. Now the apostles <coughs> indicate strongly that the, apost the apostasy, the falling away, started in their time. It would only intense and conclude and be over-encompassing in the latter time. Turn to Acts 20th chapter. We're going to read verses 29 to 30. Actually, we're going to start in verses 28 to 30. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the leadership is given an injunction to teach the whole counsel of God. For I know this, that after my departing, so Paul puts this in his own lifetime, his own generation, in the immediate future. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples from them. Now Paul gives a two-pronged warning. He talks about infiltration of false teachers. He talks about the rise of individuals within the church who would become drawn away because of their own authority and cause divisions and strife and a shutdown of the progression of the teachings of Christ. Should we understand that to mean that there will be those who previously, as in today, now, are in line with the teachings of the Word and their motivation is righteous, but because perhaps they get puffed up, who knows, whatever the reason may be, they begin to look more towards themselves as opposed to the Word. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this out is because of the spirit of um, error. And I was going to ask, is it true that the spirit of error turns those, at the time of the, uh, the uh, falling away, turns those who will become the leaders, the false prophets, into false prophets? And it's at that point, because their um, motivation is no longer pure, that they're wide open to it. Sure. Mm. Sure. Everything comes up from a spiritual influence. The spirit of fear can do the same thing. Cause an individual <coughs> to fear for his position and henceforth to ensure his own place, yes. corrupt uh, his authority and, and, and the ability of feeling that he's not of his own capable, but he's going to forcibly hold on to his position. 
but that would apply more to those who have a position as opposed to those who are rising at that point. Well, it all takes place about the same thing because right. Jesus talks about there'll be those that come proclaiming that I am Christ. Right. They'll get a position mm -hmm. and then they'll corrupt by causing deviations in the Word of God. Now we see an example where Paul is talking about somebody rising in the body of Christ and wanting to maintain authority over the church in such a way that they will block truth from coming in. Turn to 3 John. Third John, first chapter, verse nine to ten. John writes to the church. Now what's happened here, John has sent representatives to the churches giving them additional doctrine. And he writes about a problem that has arisen in one of the church communities. He says, I wrote unto the church, but the atrophies who loveth to have the preeminence among them received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds. In other words, he's saying, if I have to go there, I'm going to deal with him. Which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. I'll wait till Chris comes back. So, dia diotropies. Diotropies, yeah. Full of himself. Sounds like somebody I know. And ring a familiar bell? Yeah. <laughs> Receiveth us not. In other words, diotropies was an individual in the church elders who decided that he wanted to dominate the landscape. So he doesn't receive John's messengers who come with the word of God to give to the church communities. Community. Wherefore if I come I will remember the deeds, his deeds which he doeth. He's talking about if I come I'm going to deal with him. Pranning against us with malicious words and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, in other words, would receive them, and casteth them out of the church. Mm. Does that ring a bell? It does. <laughs> Familiar. <laughs> uh, we see that the Apostle John is not very pleased with this situation. So he's talking to the church about the atrophies. And he's telling them, this is what this guy does. He's an impediment. Um, you that have an ear, understand. Neutralizes influence. Because he is being a opposition to the progression of the whole church community. He won't receive the, the representatives that I sent giving the message. He won't receive you. And the people that have received you, he put out of the church. Mm -hmm. When I come, I'm going to deal with it. Now, that competitive spirit, let me just call it competitive spirit, is that not the same as the spirit of error? Well, the spirit of error has different attributes. Okay. What do you call this spirit that's operating in, uh, what's the name? The atrophies. The atrophies. Um, Ego. Spirit of pride. Mm. Yes. Ego. He wants to be the center of the activity. He wants to be the authority figure. And he's using his influence to neutralize 
anything he considers competition yeah. or threat to his influence. <clears throat> this happened in the Apostles' time. This is an apostate move away from the Word of God. So the Apostles were warning about this particular type of activity, which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches this happens when the people under the teacher's authority do not question their authority or receive another authority. In other words, this happens when the individual who is the authority and teaches error is not brought to give an account of what he teaches, justifying what he teaches. He's talking about one thing, and it's another where a genuine teacher teaches and then leaves and somebody else comes in and teaches contrary to that teacher and they're received by the congregation. This, you know, the apostles are telling, writing that the apostasy is taking place in their time. Mm -hmm. In the latter time it's just going to be ful fulfilled, it's going to reach its climax, its fullness and influence all of Christianity. Would you then describe the falling away as covering that entire period? 2,000 years? Yeah, but not I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's starting there. It sure. hasn't reached its fulfillment until our time. Right. There are some places that didn't experience the apostasy. There are other places that totally re received this. But what the apostles are warning about is that the apostasy is going to spread to every area of right. Christianity by our time, which is what it's doing. Right. Next principle. Turn to Galatians, third chapter, verse 1 to O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. So Paul is castigating them because they aren't questioning this heretical doctrine that has been brought forth. He's saying, what in the world is wrong with you? Why have you received this whole thing without even putting up a fight, or be, even resisting any of it? He goes on to say, This is only what I learned of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you now are made perfect by the flesh? So Paul is he's livid with them. He's prototokinous because they never questioned the doctrine. He's saying uh, um, um, just a cursory examination of what these guys have given you would let you know that they're totally out of order. They're telling you that to get right with God you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta go back to the works of the law and you know from what I told you that only by faith in Christ can you be, see, be received and accepted by God. And he's saying, how foolish you are. What is the matter with you? It's an example of people not questioning authority. And I can understand, you know, these guys came in and Satan really made it look like it's legitimate because the first thing they would say is, for giving you the word of God. And they turn to Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, keep the law and fulfill the will of God. <clears throat> Instead of questioning, well, wait a minute, what else does the scripture say? Did Jesus, Jesus tells us that stuff is gone. 
you don't pay any attention anymore. This is what bipolar is so living. Because they bought into it hook, line, and sinker. Second Corinthians. 11th chapter, verse 1 to 4, is an example of the other principle of falling under apostasy. Then Corinthians, 11th chapter, verses 1 to 4. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Now the word translated jealousy comes from a Greek term, zelou, which means jealous, but it also means extreme concern. So he's saying basically in the light of I'm very concerned about your situation and you with a godly concern. <clears throat> For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What Paul is doing is he's trying to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. He knows that the rapture is not going to take place in his lifetime. But when they die as a church, as a community, they will have all that they need to be accepted when the time comes for the rewards to be given. Paul gets the credit for all that because he has overseen their development. Now they've gone and pulled the rug out from underneath them. Not that he wants credit or he wants pride or anything, but he's re when you read the other parts of Corinthians, he rejoices in these that have started from paganism and now come into the glorious understanding of revelation knowledge and seems to be moving in a certain direction, although you accuse them of being carnal and everything else. But they shook that off and they started to progress a little more. And now he has to deal with this. And he goes on to say, I thought that you were ready. That I could in eternity point to them as an example of the reception of the word of God to the Lord. It didn't happen. It did not happen in that way. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, <coughs> so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, he's saying, I'm afraid that what I've taught you is not going to stay with you. Why? Verse 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we, or he, Paul, have not preached, or if we, if ye receive another spirit, there's your spirit of error, yep. which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. In other words, Paul is saying, churches all over the place are undergoing false teachers. I poured my heart and soul out to you. I wouldn't leave until I was sure you were grounded in the word and growing. He writes two letters. This is the second letter. He says, but now I'm concerned that everything I put in you will not last if some false teacher comes in and preaches another gospel and you don't stand firm in what I've taught you or that person comes in with the spirit of error and you openly receive it then everything I've done is for nothing. This is what he's voicing. Two concerns that lead to apostasy. People receiving carte blanche doctrine from somebody and not questioning it. And then a teacher pouring his heart and soul out and giving them the foundational teaching, giving them the, 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 the meat after the foundational teaching, leaving and another person coming in and undermining the whole thing and being received. Two ways apostasy takes root. 
And then Paul, of course, we don't have time to read it, but Paul goes on to talk about uh, the other apostles and the things that he's done for this church, how he sacrificed and suffered, and he's continuing to pour out everything to this church. He loved the, the Corinthian mm -hmm. church. So what we see here is an insight into the insidious falling away that started at the time of the apostles. By the time they left the scene, it was well entrenched. Well entrenched through the universal church that took precedence for a thousand years and dominated the landscape. Let's go on. So Mr. Jones. Yes. And then what happened? What happened? Yeah. I mean, because see, we are here now. Mm -hmm. We read about what it was like. Mm -hmm. We are now in a different situation because one of us decided to mine the scriptures and give it to whoever would take it. Where is that spoke of here? I mean, Josie, we know what we're in. God chose us to be in this situation where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. I want God to understand the credit of what He has done more than just me and you and, and whoever else is listening right now mm -hmm. can say. You know, I'm, I'm interested in praising Him beyond the, the regular amount that we go about doing things, but more than that, I want every bit of everything that everybody has that is listening to this this magnificent story, what they have to add to me, I will give whatever I can to add to you. So let's let's do this. Um, I see where we're not written in these scriptures. We are if you're looking for us. But we are not read by anybody else but us. And that's a fantastic arrangement that the God that God has designed for us. Right. Praise his name forever. Amen. Shall his name be praised. So you know, Mr. Johnson. He's not getting credit the way I think he needs to get he it. He will. He will. Now I want to address your question. What happened after that? Yes. Turn to Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend, earnestly contend, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of all ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles saw the apostasy spreading toward the end of their lives. They kept warning, kept warning, kept warning, fell on deaf ears. So, when you ask what happened, what you got was a thousand years of heretical teaching by the Catholic Church. Lack of vigilance is what's happened, Mr. Jones. And they're not they're not doing what this scripture has just now said. Hold on to that. Keep that. Keep it. Exactly. And I know a guy named Mr. Richard Jones. He is sharing the what happens next. And praise your name, oh. Mr. Jones. What we're looking at here is understanding what the scripture is saying about the people that have been victimized, are being victimized, and will continue to be victimized, and why they are in the situation they're in. They don't question 
what they teach, being taught. They will receive other teachers if they're taught the truth. They will be content where they are, believing a lie. Everybody said the same thing. Whether it was the Lord Jesus, whether it was Peter, whether it was Paul, everybody said the same thing. <clears throat> if you're not vigilant, you're going to go down to total defeat. And you're not passing. It says give to every, every living creature. You're not passing it on. No. You no. got your salvation, but you're not doing anything beyond that. And that does not please God. Well, you read Jude here. <clears throat> it didn't please the apostles either. Paul <clears throat> poured out his heart and soul to try to keep it from happening. Paul would preach in a church. He'd leave that church and right away the false apostles, the false teachers would come right in behind him and undermine everything he preached. That's why you have these letters. Because he's writing to reestablish the, the, the tenets of what he originally established to begin with. <clears throat> but let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches, well, where's this leading? Where's this going? You ask, what happens next? Jew. Well, what goes beyond Jew? Scripture teaches. <clears throat> the authority of the false teachers will totally corrupt the followers if it is not stopped by them. Those that are under false teachers false doctrines are going to grow more and more and more under a corrupting influence that will totally it doesn't stay <clears throat> to a point where okay you're halfway in and halfway out you know you may make it when things happen no either going to be all the way in or going to be all the way out those that are yielding to the influences unbeknownst to them are becoming more and more and more restricted and restrained because they're not growing they're not coming under a, a, uh, an understanding of being ready for what's coming down the pike we're going to take a look at where the majority of these that are allowing this to happen where they're going to wind up turn to second peter second chapter there's one to two But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So he's talking about the apostasy taking place in his time. He's writing to the church of his time, warning them of things that are going to happen in his time. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. That happens in the time of the apostles. And many, many, many shall follow their pernicious, the word pernicious there is destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The truth is going to be undermined. If it started in Peter's time, but it was not allowed to coalesce totally until our time, what does that mean? mean? It means that in this time <clears throat> it's going to totally corrupt the individual that's sitting under it. Notice what he says. Verse 2. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. So they're going to take on the lifestyle of the leader. If that leader is a shyster the people that he is overseeing are going to be shysters, liars, cheaters, uh, whatever you get. They're going to be totally corrupted because they are not advancing in righteousness. They're advancing in evil. 
Remember what he says about the atrophies. Don't sit under him, his authority, because it's evil. You sit under his authority, you're going to wind up doing and being Something. evil. Let's go on. <clears throat> this thing is going to reach a point where it totally, it totally is going to litter the Christian landscape. Christians were warned then, they're warned now. You, you can't escape it. You're going to be surrounded by it. What do yeah. you do about it? Turn to 1 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 9 to 13. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world so he's talking about yeah, fellowshipping with unsaved people yeah. or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters or <clears throat> for then must ye needs go out of the world so he's saying you separate yourself from unsaved people that have criminal tendencies, that are sinners, sinful habits, and all the rest of it. He's not saying not to fellowship <clears throat> with somebody who has a moral character, because you have something. He can, it doesn't have to be saved, but he has to be a moral individual who comports himself in a way in which <clears throat> he is living a life that's open to morality because if you fellowship with that person he's open to receive what you have to give him you fellowship with a drunk you fellowship with a thief you fellowship with a criminal you got no opportunity to give him anything he's going to try to corrupt you so Paul is saying mark the individual and make sure if this is the type of personality he has you keep away from him but if he has a tendency in which you can um, have a relationship with him by all means. Do so because you can, you can uh, uh, show Christ to this person, and ultimate. And, and we all have had that opportunity. People that God puts us in uh, a situation with on our jobs that are open to hear what we have to say, and uh, be acceptable to it, and then go on from there. Make him a brother. That's pleasing to the Lord. <clears throat> did that with my German friend. I said, uh, you teach me German, I'll bring you to the Lord. He said, okay, it sounds good to me. Yeah, well, I'm doing it. Anyway, so he goes on. Notice what he says in verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any, if any, man that is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. So he goes on to talk about if a Christian exhibits these characteristics, you don't break bread with them, you don't fellowship with them, you distinct from them because they will corrupt you. Hmm. Now turn to 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, verse 1 to 5. This is the signs that he's talking about, that Peter is talking about, of people who sat under false teachers and been corrupted by them, taking on that lifestyle. By the time of the end of the age, the quote-unquote church will exhibit this lifestyle. Only the minority 
are going to exhibit the lifestyle of Christ. So Paul writes this to those that are living at that time what they should do. This know also that in the last days, so he's talking about future time, our time, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. He's talking about Christians. He isn't writing to the church about the condition of unsaved people in the last time. We'd be wasting his time. Everybody knows that. He's talking about the conditions of the church at the last time. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This seals the cake. It's telling you that the people he's talking about are professing Christians who profess to love God but by their lifestyle they show what they really are. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. The word power there means authority. They claim Christianity but they won't follow the authority of the Word of God. That's totally doesn't come under their purview. But they want to. Uh, they want to illustrate that they are people of God, form of godliness, but denying the authority thereof. From such, turn away. That's the injunction for the saints at the time when the Lord is going to judge the world, the earth, the inhabitants of the earth. These people. Are going, what, what is going to be the destiny of these, these people? Turn to Jeremiah 25. Thirty-four to thirty-six. Pound ye shepherds and cry, bow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. This is talking about the apostate church, organized religion, the leadership, and those that have positions of authority. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are accomplished, you shall fall like a pleasant vessel, and the shepherds shall have no way to flee nor the principle of the flock to escape. Now turn to Jeremiah 23. Verse 2. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock, driven them away, have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. So it's talking about the leadership. It's talking about <coughs> the gathering the followers are all going to be judged by their lifestyle. We're going to close with Luke 21. Verse 35. 
For as a snare shall it come on all, A-L-L, -L, all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So if you are an inhabitant of the earth when this takes place, one of two things are going to happen to you. You are going to be in a situation in which your lifestyle, your lifestyle is going to become your judgment or your liberty. One of the two. If you are following a tyrannical false prophet, false teacher, who's taken the scripture and just totally distorted it to a point where people hate the Lord rather than love Him, when this day falls, it's going to fall heavy. They're going to be destroyed by their lifestyle. Whatever it is they're doing, it's going to come upon them and take them down. If you are one of those that has heed Paul's warning, do not fellowship. Do not uh, uh, be caught in that type of a lifestyle when the hatchet falls. The door is going to swing open to you. You're going to walk free, being used of the Lord unimpeded to carry forth the gospel. One or two things are going to happen. We're talking about the Christian society here, not unsaved people, Christians. You're going to find leading up to this a division because the Bible says so. Christians growing closer to the Lord. Christians falling away from the Lord. One of the two. There's no in-between. You can look and you can discern. You make a decision what path you want. You want to draw closer to the Lord or you're content to fall away from Him. You fall away from Him, I guarantee you're going to be part of this judgment. You grow closer to Him. When this judgment falls, the door is going to swing open. You're going to walk free. Who is that?